All right, guys. Welcome to another day in uh, in speech calm 101. We started on the lessons on argumentation the other day, and uh, I want to follow up on those now. We're moving into chapter 10 in uh, in our topic. You'll find this PowerPoint in the files section of your uh, Canvas class and in uh, called Argument 2. And I think I have another one, Argument 3, that has a few different kinds of slides, but I want to talk about this idea of argument. In traditional education, when I say traditional, I mean the kind of the kind of education that has been um, true of the Western world for the last 23, 2500 years. There were three sections. I may have mentioned this before. I can't recall. Um, but Marshall McLuhan, one of the founders of the communication field, um, was definitely had his main um tenure during the 50s and 60s wrote a book um his actually his um phd dissertation turned into a book was called the classical trivium and he believed that there were three branches to classical education well there are two pillars all right there's letters and numbers right um and there were the there's the quadrivium which was the four the four branches of numbers and then there was the trivium which was the three branches of letters all right so in the trivium uh there were three basic branches which was grammar that was anything from learning to read learning to um, your ABCs, learning to read, um, learning to understand texts, to analyze, um, to assess, and to interpret. All right, all those ideas of reading and gathering information are kind of tied up in this idea of grammar. The second one was rhetoric and uh, the kind of the synonym of speech comm is rhetoric, but rhetoric has to do with the production side of language or the letters, right? So it can include public speaking, but it's not limited to public speaking. It also can include um, writing essay answers, um, answering about the knowledge that you have gained from the analysis and the reading that you did right from the grammar um writing reports writing essays and of course writing speeches and delivering speeches so anything that's on the production side would be can would fall into this category of rhetoric then the third one and what was considered the most high level um cognitive ability was um was logic or reasoning or what we call here argumentation. Um, and it has to do with thinking through problems, problem solving, um, basically ration, um, rational thought. This isn't unconscious, but this is rather conscious, intentional, um, willful, um, aware kinds of thinking, all right? And so um, this third level, actually um, argumentation is kind of a, um, it kind of crosses all three, you know, from the listening side where you're trying to understand and interpret your opponent's um, positions 
and thinking critically about what they're saying to then formulating an answer and then thinking through and problematizing and solving those problems um, that are intrinsic in that answer. So chapter 10 in our text is actually, I think, um, kind of the meat and potatoes of this whole second half of the book. Um, we may have to take um, at least a couple of lectures just on chapter 10. Um, because I think it's so critical for us to understand what's involved in argumentation. Um, let's start with Pericles. He was a, an Attic statesman. In other words, he was um, one of the generals and one of the leaders of Athens. Um, he was actually during one of the periods of Athens when it was not quite democratic, but rather um, ruled over by a dictator by someone who had um, more high-level um, authority in the city. He was a military general, and so it was more of a military dictator style. Still right-wing, probably, is what we would consider. He defended Athens against the onslaught of the Persians. Anyway, um, he, we still have some of his speeches, some of his philosophy, and this is one uh, I think is a very um, compelling quote. One who forms a judgment on any point but cannot explain it clearly might as well never have thought at it, never have thought at all on the subject. All right, so um, the, the process of argumentation is not only having judgments or having decisions, and the use of the word judgment means making a decision, right? We have to perform judgments every day. We choose between good and better things every day. We choose between good and bad things every day. We choose um, what we're going to do, how we're going to think. And each one of those decisions is, you know, may be a good choice or a bad choice. And a lot of it goes into um, what is our reasoning? What is our motivation? Why did we choose that? What is accomplished by choosing that? How, um, how is, uh, um, what is like, what information have we gathered before we made that, before we made that decision? Is this a decision that we've made often enough um, and we did the research like years ago, and now it's just kind of on autopilot, which is fine. That's fine, right? Um, when you're facing new situations, for example, meeting new people, and you're trying to make a judgment on them without knowing who they are, you know, that's where the word prejudice comes from, prejudging, judging without knowing the evidence. And uh, Pericles was very concerned that we judged based on evidence, clear thought, rational um, and um, well-documented argumentation. All right. And so what I want to talk about in this first part is what is the relationship between argumentation and truth? Right. We talked about a little bit in that last section um, that we have, we hold this principle that ultimate truth is knowable, that ultimate truth is achievable, attainable. Um, and so what is our, what is the relationship between our decisions and truth, between our judgments, our um, thinking and truth. And if we are trying to persuade someone else, change their way of thinking, then what are the grounds on which we will try to change their way of thinking? There has to be some compelling pit, uh, points that will help them kind of push them over the edge to move from what they believe now to a new position. 
and hopefully the compelling the most compelling arguments come from speaking truth right so hopefully y'all are able to actually understand based on truth and truth is um considered a, in in a in Greek thought um, had three parameters to it. Okay? It had three parameters. Ethos, pathos, and logos. Right? It's called the triangle of, of um, truth or persuasion. Um, now, Different ones. You'll see the 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 um the triangle built in different ways, and um, I tend to put, you know, you have like a basically an equilateral triangle. Let me use um, a a sketch board for a moment. Okay, so here we have our triangle. And you'll see that in, even in the modern day kind of um, speech com world, different people put different priorities and, and put the three pillars in different places. Personally, um, I am going to start here at the top with logos, all right? And um, uh, hopefully I'll be able to explain it. All right, logos is at the top. Then I, I go left, which to me um, corresponds to the left side of my body, my heart. And I put here pathos. Actually, my script on screen is, is doing okay. <laughs> um, and then thirdly, I put ethos. All right. Now it'll take um it'll take a minute to kind of jump back and forth between these two. Um, and probably if I leave this, I'll ha I won't be able to get back into it. But let me let me explain logos for the Stoics and for the Greek philosophers was the prime cause of all things. All right. Um, it, it later um, kind of devolved the the concept of logos devolved and just became you know whatever um, makes the most sense to an individual. But originally, the idea of the logos was, you know, in every scientific process, there is a cause and an effect. If we talk about the beginning of all things, we go all the way back. If we scroll all the way back to the very beginning, you know, okay, what caused the beginning? Um, and e e there are many theories about that, right? Um, God said, let there be. That's um, what we, in our assumptions, and in my bias, that's where I'm going to take people, because um, I believe, you know, there is good evidence for that being the basis of truth. Um, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. God said, let, let there be. Um, there are other theories, right? Um, let's say people claiming a scientific um, perspective, they say the Big Bang, right? That there was all the matter in the world was condensed into one 
um, huge giant atom, and that and it became more and more and more and more condensed until finally, boom, everything kind of um, splattered out into uh, into what we now know as reality. All right, but what caused that atom? Right. So anytime somebody gives you a point, a starting point, we can go back behind that that and say, OK, but what caused that? What was the first cause? What is the primary cause? And uh, for us, of course. For the Greeks, the primary cause was the logos. And I have no problem with saying, you know, it was God. Whatever theory you want to have about the timelines, and I will completely agree that no one has a perfect timeline on everything that's happened. If we assume um, kind of a a theory of, of continuity that all things have continued as they were from the beginning of the earth, you know, I think that's erroneous. I think there has been peak and spikes and and highs and lows in the processing of time over overall and I think even the scripture um, indicates that um, one such example would be the Noah the Noahic flood it had such a tremendous impact on the cosmos well particularly our world that um, it, it stands in a class by itself as far as um, time goes. And then the, 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 follow, the following um, ice, you know, ice cap uh, process. And anyway, um, we're, this isn't a geology class necessarily. But so even if we say that we believe in you know in the in even if we were to like condense everything that's in for example genesis chapter 5 as far as the the years that are counted in, in that genealogy and there are there are problems with that you know we know that there are some things that were left out that are indicated in other places but just saying we accepted that in the 6,000 year view, which I don't have a problem with, by the way. Um, still, those 6,000 years, to assume that time um, happens now like it did back then is rather naive. To assume that time progresses, you know, so what we would consider of consider a night and day period if there was if there was some objective standard of length of 24 hours length of um you know earth rotation around the sun or sun rotation around the earth um we know that that has varied over the years right um, the Earth does not spin at the exact same speed that it did before. The universe, just to follow the first and second laws of thermodynamics, the Earth is in a process of deceleration. It may be minute, we, it may be imperceptible to us, but the process of increasing entropy is a rule that God has placed into the world and it is caused by sin. And so because of the entrance of sin, it throws our ability to be able to perceive and count time off. Okay, so that's what I meant by in our last lecture whenever I said we need to be humble about our ability to perceive. All right, so we believe the Bible. We believe exactly what it says. We take it literally. We take it um, figuratively or in whatever genre of language and literature that it is that it presents itself in each section. 
and try to rightly divide it. But even within that, there is room for discussion. There's room for debate. There's room for disagreement. And we have to be humble and ask, um, you know, to go to the Logos himself to, to, to be educated and to be enlightened and ask for his spirit to lead us. So based on that, of course, I put Logos at the top of our um, pyramid of truth, right? The second major point of truth is pathos. That's emotional truth, right? That is um, empathy. That's where we get our word empathy and sympathy from, that, co that connection to the emotions. And in argumentation, many people will try to hijack and manipulate emotions, and that is an inappropriate use of pathos. We have to be honest, we have to be sincere, we have to be forthright in our presentation. And then ethos is the, um, the sense of um, authority, right? So it's different from truth in the sense it's, uh, it is um, kind of the praxis of truth, right? The actual application of what we've learned. Ethics is how do we put into practice the things that we believe, right? Right and wrong. We, we, there's, this, there's this universal, unchangeable, unshakable standard of truth, and then how do we apply that in our everyday situations? And in a broken world, when you're upholding one principle of justice, you may be violating another one. And we don't have these clear black and white abilities to, um, to, to understand. So having this, con this um, concept of the um the mind and the will and the emotions and these being the the three pronged anchor to truth right corresponding to the three pronged aspects of our own souls um is the basis on which we build argumentation all right let's go back to the um to the to the PowerPoint. So, Logos is a former argument based on logic, facts, and figures. So that's kind of the devolved um, form of it, but it's, it's accurate, right? It has to do with true principles of, of rationalism. It has to do with facts, and it has to do with observable phenomena. Pathos, a form of argument based on emotions, whether it's fear, desire, sympathy, anger. Hopefully we have some altruistic emotions, right? Like love and service. And that's what um, we have talked about in this class, um, being able to serve others through speech. And then ethos is a form of argument based on character or authority. Um, and authority is, an, is derived, right? Character is derived. It's not intrinsic in itself. I believe that character and authority are derived from the original basis of logos. Um, no, there's no, uh, there's no authority that stands on its own underived except God. All right. So truth and argumentation, moving back and forth between truth seeking and persuasion. Whenever we are helping someone come to those crucial moments in their life in which they are changing their mind, in which they are trying to change their way of life, we move back and forth between the ultimate truth and bringing them from where they are to this point of truth, right? 
persuasion is being able to move people from where they are to a point closer to the truth. Um, at least about face, where they are facing in the direction of truth. And in order to do that, we have to consider what does my audience already believe and value, and then how can I tap this belief to persuade them? How can I help them see, how can we find some common ground in which uh, a commonality of beliefs in which we can um, build a process of logic? Okay, and that's where argumentation comes in. Is it, it's kind of a the logical stepwise structure that moves you from where you are to some place closer to truth. And I really like this verse. Um, 2 Corinthians 4, 2, we've renounced disgraceful, underhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning or tamper with God's word. But by the open statement of the truth, we commend ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. So this should be our heart. This should be our desire right here. Right, and this was definitely Paul's expression. Faced with, um, right after he had left Corinth and he had given his defense there on Mars Hill, speaking to the, um, to the, basically the ecclesia of, of Athens, um, he spoke to the, um, the public forum there. Um, then he comes down to Corinth and he faces a completely different situation. He says, I didn't come with power of words or um, elaborate argumentation, but rather with, with Holy Spirit and power. Um, he says, you know, wear your heart on your shirt sleeves. Um, present truth in its in its true form in within the word of god not manipulating right not cunning not devious not um using people's push buttons in order to get them to do what we want them to do and unfortunately you find this even within christianity that there are some people that use christianity um as a whipping post, and rather than presenting the Word of God as it is in truth, they use the, the laws and the condemnations of the Word of God in order to guilt or manipulate people's emotions into doing um, the things that they, uh, that they want them to do. And rather than um, dealing with, with truth straight on, they use truth for their own ulterior motives. Um, and we'll come back to that. So, truth is, uh, or argumentation is not a fight. It's not a card. Whenever I say argumentation, Notice that I use that, go all the way out to that full form of it, argumentation, all right? It's not the same thing as an argument. You might use argumentation in an argument, and you probably will, but by definition, argumentation is not necessarily a fight or a quarrel. And it's not necessarily a pro-con debate. Again, you may use argumentation to support your position, but argumentation is the process of stepwise building of a structure based on logic, right? So you present your premise, you present your thesis, if you want, if you will, and then you sub you proceed to support that thesis through evidence, and that evidence has to relate to the audience that you're speaking to, and kind of 
get um bring them on their level step by step by step by step from where they are to where um you know you desire them to be and hopefully again you are bringing them to a place of truth and so you are serving them by presenting the truth as accurately and honestly as possible. Um, the argumentation may be subtle or impl implicit in the way you present it. It may be through storytelling, right? Where you're not coming out and saying, turn or burn, there is a place and a time for that. But sometimes when you come along and you present a story, like Nathan did whenever he came to King David, and King David had sinned, and he had committed adultery with Bathsheba, and he had committed murder against Bathsheba's husband by sending him to the very front, hottest part of the battle to be killed, and then tried to cover up the fact that the child that was born was his rather than uh, um, Uriah's. Nathan comes to him and tells him a story. He tells him about this, um, this poor little family that had one pet lamb, right? And David being a shepherd and being a shepherd king could relate to that story. And, and the rich guy next to him who had a thousand sheep or however many it was, had a multitude of sheep, didn't want to spoil his flock. And so he stole the one pet lamb and gave it as a sacrifice. And of course, this raised the indignation of David before Nathan pointed out, he says, you are the one. This is you. You're the one who took the one guy's um, pet lamb Whereas you've got a dozen wives, you know, and either and you should be satisfied with any one of them or all of them or whatever. So the point is, sometimes a story can carry you from point A to point B um, more surely than just a syllogism. So that brings us back to this uh, little quote that I have here truth is not born and i'm not sure that i agree with this but it it raises some interesting questions all right truth is not born nor is it to be found inside the head of an individual person it is born between people collectively searching for truth in the process of their dialogic interaction so i want to so this argumentation is focused on these last two words dialogic interaction and if we go back to the um to the greek uh philosophers any of y'all had the privilege of reading plato's works you know that all of his works are written as dialogues and his and his um prime character in all of his works was his old prof socrates all right, so when we think of the, the wise man Socrates, it's because that Plato preserved, um, some people say he preserved it, some people say he just used Socrates as a character in fictitious dialogues. Um, I, don't, I don't have enough, uh, I'm not smart enough to debate either, either one of those positions. Um, my point is that Plato used dialogue and showed how Socrates in those stories used dialogue to bring someone from where they were to, for them, you know, through step, logical steps of progression to an under, uh, another or a new understanding of truth. And so dialogue, I think, is essential. Whenever you see Christ talking with the um the the um the levite the priest um nicodemus in john chapter five uh, john chapter three you have this dialogue going on right nicodemus comes with some questions jesus answers them with some other questions 
He makes some statements. He says, you must be born again. And this statement, you know, so Jesus, in a sense, he runs forward and get, and projects the goal that he had that that is essential there. And then he comes running back and says, don't you get it? And then through a, peer, a process of different um, different illustrations, right? The, the illustration of the wind and how the spirit works in, in a sense like the wind and the, uh, and, the, and the bringing in of the Old Testament talking about Moses raising up the serpent in the wilderness. He brings Nicodemus from where he is to, we find Nicodemus in later chapters, first becoming more bold to stand for truth and finally taking a firm stand in the light as a follower and as a disciple. Previously hidden, previously secretly, but now boldly there at the crucifixion, right? And he, st and he, he joins with Joseph of Arimathea in um, preparing the body of Christ. All right, I'm going to stop right there for now, and we're going to come back to um, discussing argumentation in the next segment.